Hello and welcome to another video by Adrian Davis from Pure Electric. In this video, I'll be discussing some of the basic knowledge and considerations that I believe are required for you to perform safe isolation correctly and avoid anyone receiving an electric shock or damage to tools and equipment. Before we can gain access to life parts, we have to satisfy the Electricity at Work Regulations 1989 and using the guidance set out by Electrical Safety First Best Practice Guide 2. Guidance on the management of electrical safety and safe isolation for low voltage installations, which is available for free from Electrical Safety First online. Just click the link on the screen. This is what Electrical Safety First Best Practice Guide 2 suggests on page five. And as you can see at the bottom, it clearly states that all three conditions must be met in order for work on or near live conductors to be carried out. These regulations may be due an upgrade as they appear to be suggesting that all electricians may be male. I'm sure it's just a typo, but it just goes to prove that people don't read these regulations, as this is the first time that I've noticed it myself and I've not heard anyone else mention it before. It also references the HSE Electricity at Work Regulations 1989 Regulation 14, which also has the same typo. To comply with Regulation 14, work on or near live conductors, dead working should be the normal method of carrying out work on electrical equipment and circuits. We can comply with this regulation by safely isolating the live conductors at various points within the installation before we gain access to them. In the majority of situations, there should not be many reasonable circumstances where the installation should be live, but every job should be taken on its own merits. So why is safe isolation so important? Well, firstly, there are the legal reasons. And if you ever ended up in a court of law, you would have to prove beyond all reasonable doubt that what you did complied, and there may even be a panel of specialists trying to prove otherwise. This is where Regulation 29, the Defence Regulation, comes into play. It also references electricity at work regulations in BS 7671 at the front, and it states that if you comply with BS 7671, you comply with the electricity at work regulations. Ultimately, in the real world, it's your call, but for your training assessments, you have to comply, and I wouldn't take any shortcuts that you have been shown on site, as this could prove costly for your assessments. Ask yourself why these laws exist. The answer is to protect people from themselves or from other incompetent people. So what are the dangers from electric shock? When I talk about this at work, I always put this question to the room and ask them to put their hands up. It never ceases to amaze me how many people think that getting an electric shock is part of the job or a risk worth taking. And some even think it's funny and brag about how many electric shocks they've had or how many pairs of new cutters they've had to replace because they keep blowing them up. When I ask people why they don't perform safe isolation, I hear excuses like, we don't have time. My boss doesn't do it. No one does it. One guy was even told that if he got the safe isolation kit off of the van, he would be thrown off of site. So this leads me to believe that we have an institutionalized complacency to the dangers of electricity, which is putting people at risk. Your employer could argue that you don't need a safe isolation kit because they are in charge of the installation. And while that may be true, they still have obligations under the electricity at work regulations and still need to perform safe isolation for any circuit that is being worked on. I would argue even more so for persons under their supervision as they are the duty holder and it would not look favorably in court if they failed in that duty. For you, you have to ask the question, are you happy to put your life in the hands of someone else? Look at Regulation 13, for instance. This regulation therefore requires that adequate precautions are taken to ensure that conductors and equipment cannot inadvertently be energized while the work is taking place. This is the process of safe isolation. By now, you must have seen how easy it is to receive an electric shock or blow your cutters up. All it takes is a split second of misjudgment and someone could die, and it could be you. So my next question at this point is, what do you think saved you? I've already shown them this picture during their induction. So I remind them that the sensation of electric shock may only be one to two milliamps due to the impedance of the body. And had they been holding onto a zero potential on the other hand, the current could have gone directly across their heart, potentially causing death. 
a current of as little as 0 0.007 amps or 7 milliamps across the heart for three seconds is enough to kill. 0 0.1 amps passing through the body will almost certainly be fatal. Other factors that can determine the severity of an electric shock include the duration of the shock and where the shock enters the body. For example, a shock passing from one arm through your chest to the other arm is more dangerous as it goes across your heart rather than a shock between two fingers. This extract is from 1966 Journal of the American Physical Therapy Association, and I want to draw your attention to this passage here. While any amount of current over 10 milliampers, 0.01 amp, is capable of producing painful to severe shock, currents between 100 and 200 milliampers, so 0.1 to 0.2 amperes, are lethal. Currents above 200 milliampers, while producing severe burns and unconsciousness, do not usually cause death if the victim is given immediate attention. Resuscitation consisting of artificial respiration will usually revive the victim. This just goes to show how serious the situation really is and why lone working around electricity carries a much higher risk. So again, I suggest to you that if you're being left in charge of jobs, while your employer leaves the building and goes elsewhere, you need to be in control of the electricity and ensure that it is switched off and isolated, because if there is an accident, there won't be anyone there to revive you. So once electrons penetrate your skin, your body contains different appearances through each body part. And if you were to become part of the circuit, then electrons would start to flow through your body, causing tissue damage. Your body is also controlled by small electrical impulses. These are disrupted and overridden, which can be detrimental to your bodily functions. For example, stopping your heart from beating, your lungs from working, as well as heating up the flesh and literally cooking you and potentially destroying your body's cells with short-term effects and long-term consequences to your health. You also see from this table that as voltage increases, your body's impedance, which is the resistance your body has to the electron flow, decreases. And there is only a 75 ohm difference between 225 volts and 400 volts. If you're interested in this article, the link is at the top of the screen. BS7671 also states that the touch voltage should not exceed 50 volts, as this is where the voltage is strong enough to push electrons through your skin more easily, which is why we use RCDs to limit the current in a fault condition. On page 64, regulation 411.5.3 gives the formula RA times I delta N is equal to or less than 50 volts. If you then take a look at table 41.5, you will see that they have already calculated the maximum current in milliamps and the resistance you can have before that 50 volt touch voltage is reached. It's also worth noting that if your skin is wet or you have a cut, then that touch voltage can be dramatically reduced as the barrier your skin provides is no longer intact. So it could take less voltage to make, break through the impedance of the skin. Even if you didn't receive an electric shock directly, you may have blown your cutters up. Due to the low resistance of the metal, the current would have been able to flow unimpeded and to a much higher level before the overcurrent protective device would have operated. We will talk more about this in subsequent videos within this series. So thankfully for you and your family, you are hopefully holding insulated tools, which according to the hierarchy of controls would come under PPE, the least effective form of protection. As it's the least effective method, it's classed as your last line of defense and you should only be using that to minimize any further risk once the more effective methods have been implemented. Which begs the question, what caused the hole in your cutters and how much current was flowing? The easiest way to describe this is to consider arc welding. Essentially, when you are arc welding, you are putting an electric current through a piece of wire. That current will melt that wire with the metal you are welding into a molten pool of metal. And that is what happened to your cutters. The amount of electrons flowing through your cutters was enough to turn the metal molten and even vaporize it. So how much current would it take to do that? Well, here is a quick look at the supply current to give you an idea of why we need to protect people from electricity. We will cover this in more detail in the subsequent videos as we work our way through the testing process. But as you can see here, I've used 230 volts as my baseline voltage along with a TNCS earthing system 
which the on-site guides suggest should have a maximum external resistance of 0.35 ohms. The lower this figure is, the higher the potential current that is available in a full condition. We then divide 230 volts by 0.35 and we get a current of 657.14 amps, or roughly 0.66 kA on your multifunction tester. In this table, you can see that when the resistance goes down, the current goes up, exactly like you were taught at college. As the resistance starts to drop below 0.15 ohms, you can really see that current jump exponentially. Effectively, the closer we are to the local transformer, the lower the resistance in the supply cable and the higher the fault current available. Now, the question you have to ask yourself is, do I want myself or anyone else for that matter to be connected to that amount of current? And hopefully the answer is a firm no. You are being paid to do a job and that includes safe isolation and not only keeping yourself safe, but those around you. If you haven't been given enough time to complete the job safely, then the job failed before you even got there. Your responsibility to ensure that whoever made that mistake is the person who feels the pressure, not you. The two things that get cut on site when there isn't enough time are health and safety and inspection and testing. If you keep covering up their mistakes and cutting corners to make the job achievable, ultimately you are bailing them out by putting your life at risk. You have to ask yourself, would they do the same for you? What is the safe isolation process? Here I have a slide that I teach the apprentices and I've given some examples to help you during safe isolation. Elimination is always the most effective means of protection because if there is no hazard, no one can get hurt. It's as simple as that. We can substitute high voltage for low voltage and 50 volts is considered to be your safe touch voltage, which we have discussed. Engineering controls are implemented to stop people interfering with your safe isolation process. And the admin controls are RAMs, signage, notifying people of procedures, working out of hours, and ultimately who is taking responsibility. Finally, we have PPE, which again is your last line of defense when all the other controls have failed or as a way to lower any remaining risk after a risk assessment has been carried out. Here is an example of a basic safe isolation kit. This kit is comprising of a voltage indicator complying with BSEN 61010-031, or in this instance, BSEN 61243-3, a proving unit capable of showing the full range voltage for the circuits that you are working on, a lock with a unique key that only you have access to. Try and get a long one like this, as it will be long enough to fit through rotary isolators, etc. A warning label that shows other people who is in control so that they can contact you if they need it removed. If you think about it, someone might be tempted to interfere with the device if they have no idea who it belongs to and it's stopping them from working. The longer it goes on, the more dangerous the situations can become because they're going to get frustrated and more anxious to get going. You'll also need a selection of toggles for a range of devices to so try to get a decent range. The multi clasp at the top is for multiple people to put their lock into. And when the last person has removed their lock, only then can the circuit be energized. If you take a good look at HSC's publication GS38, and I suggest you do because it will be in your exams, it will describe and detail the level of protection that your voltage indicator should achieve. Here are a few brief points. Again, it needs to conform to BSEN 61243-3 and displays the installation categories, so whether that's category two, three or four. The probes and tips need to be two to four mil maximum for the metal that is showing. TIS 859 comes with retractable tips that are replaceable. It needs to have finger barriers to stop you from sticking into the live terminals as you're pushing the test into them insulated and durable leads that won't get damaged easily, the manufacturer's name, and possibly even a high braking capacity fuse and or current limitation. For those of you that don't know, current limitation is where the internal resistance is so high that current cannot flow easily. This protects you from having a highly dangerous probe tip waving around when the other probe is connected to the line terminal. The guidance set out by Best Practice Guide 2, Issue 3, is that you should preferably test your voltage indicator safely on a dedicated proving unit like this one, rather than accessing live terminals. It also suggests that electricians who work on installations or regularly work on installations 
that have been energized should have one. And even those that only occasionally work on installation should have one too. Electrical Safety First have also brought out further guidance on the limitation of plug-in devices such as socket testers, as they are not suitable for safe isolation. A lot of people miss the key information on the front of the unit as they are not capable of picking up a neutral earth reverse. The Best Practice Guide 2 also advises against the use of voltage sticks for safe isolation purposes as they are not reliable or accurate and their use as such has caused accidents. It is worth noting that non-contact voltage indicators can be useful for identifying if a cable is potentially live without having to gain access to live parts, but that if the stick does not illuminate, you cannot assume that the cable is dead and should instead continue to proceed caution and assume that it is live until proven otherwise. Although cables with a metallic sheath, for example, FP, SWA or SY flex can shield the volt stick from picking up the electric field required to make it work. So it may not be suitable for those cables. They are also handy for identifying if a class one metallic accessory or enclosure has been earthed as they will illuminate when touched against the enclosure. So let's put that into context in the real world. If you were, for instance, about to move a washing machine or dishwasher, metallic washing machine or dishwasher, which is a class one accessory, and you're about to pull it out, the first thing that you would do is you would put your volt stick against it. If it illuminated, that would mean that the device is not earthed correctly. OK, and that will help you make a judgment as you're pulling the machine out, obviously isolating it first. Best Practice Guide 2 also quotes the following. The Electricity at Work Regulations 1989 definition of isolation is given in Regulation 12 and means the disconnection and separation of the electrical equipment from every source of electrical energy in such a way that this disconnection and separation is secure. In effect, this means not just cutting off the supply, but also ensuring that the means of disconnection is secure as described in this guide. In most instances, this will require securing the means of disconnection in the off position, and it is highly recommended that a caution notice or label is posted at the point of disconnection as described in the guide under safe isolation procedures. As you can imagine, electrical tape does not qualify as a secure device. It can easily be peeled off or fall off, which means that someone else can easily be in control of your electrical installation. If someone else were to energize the installation and there was a death as a result, being the duty holder, you would be the person who could be prosecuted. So that concludes part one, where we have discussed the Electricity at Work Regulations 1989, how we can comply with that statutory document, and I've shown you what can happen when you receive an electric shock to prove why this simple but effective procedure can keep people safe. In part two of this video, I will now talk you through where and how to isolate by showing you with simplified pictures and diagrams to give you the best chance at success whether that is in your college and AM2 assessments or in a real life environment. Please also look out for the next video in my inspection testing series for electrical apprentices. I hope you've enjoyed watching and if you like this content and want to see more, then please like, share and subscribe to get these important messages out there so that everyone can benefit from them. After all, if we all love, care and take individual responsibility for this industry, then our everyday world would be a much more positive place to be. Take care.